What's up, everybody? My name is Kason. Welcome back to the WDL. This is season two, week five of the Heinler division. This kind of marks our halfway point throughout the season. If you guys didn't watch last week, we had a bunch of guest casters take over for me, uh, which I really, really appreciated. We had uh, Turambar, Sand Rooster, Surf Taco, Ram9, and Spike all cast a bunch of matches for me. But this week, I am back in action. I'm very, very excited to do so. And uh, we've got five new best of threes for you guys this week, so it should be really exciting. This is the final week before our supplemental draft. If you don't know what that is, I'll go over it at the end of the video. Uh, but for now, let's go ahead and take a look at the standings before week five and see how these teams shake out. So first of all, tied for first place, we've got Dr. Dickhead in the Foolish Mortals with 12 points, along with McCrane in the Materia Hunters. Ram 9 in third place with the Rock Boys with 9 points. Maverick in the Spaghetti Western and Jesus LBL in the Straw Hats tied currently for fourth place with 7 points. Turambar in the Fire Ferrets with 6 Zathria in 7th place, the Ghostbloods with 5 points, Spike in 8th with Bebop's crew with 4, Catra in Sandrock with 3 points in ninth place, and then in last we have Jebba and the Sappers with 2 points. So a very, very competitive league. Obviously a couple teams right up at the top who are undefeated, but past that it's kind of anybody's game. It should be a really, really good day today. We've got 5 best of 3s. Let's go ahead and jump into them and get into the team previews. For our first matchup preview today, we've got Catra on the left side of the Guild Lapis, coach of the team Sandrock, versus the right side here, Maverick of the Guild Vandals, coach of the Spaghetti Western. Uh, two really solid teams. Catra only has three points up to this point, but don't let that fool you. Uh, he's got a very, very strong team, and this should be a very, very good series. Maverick right there sitting with seven points has himself in really good shape right now. He is like right on the edge of playoffs. I believe, like I said, I think he's either fourth or fifth currently right now. Um, so he's doing pretty well for himself. Catra, this is a really big series for him. If he does happen to win this, he would boost up to six points and really put himself right in the thick of things to try and make the playoffs. And Maverick, if he wins sitting at 10, I mean, that just ups his chances so much in trying to get into that top four, which is where you want to try and get. So let's look, take a look at the teams here. Catro's got Esther, Saro, Setia, Prompto, Maraga, Venera Winter, Silma, Curry, Gafgarian, and Sosha. Up to this point, the star of Catro's team, kind of surprisingly, is Silma. Silma has seven kills up to this point. The MR unit, only 60 cost. She's been putting in a lot of work. And obviously, we can't forget about Saro, who currently has six kills and six assists. These have definitely been the strongest two units on his team up to this point. Would not be surprised to see either one of them come out. On Maverick's side here, uh, has yet to use Velus, which I believe was his first overall pick, but he has some really, really nice other options. We have seen the full mage comp of like Skahal, Gargas, Salir come out multiple times uh, to some really good success. We've seen him use Little Leela Halloween as kind of a blitz strategy against Turambar. That worked quite well. And he's got some other options with some different tanks that we haven't necessarily seen a lot, uh, but with Agrius or Mont King of Leonis. I'll be curious to see what we see today, but let's go ahead and jump into game one and see what these teams brought. All right, guys, match number one, game number one. We've got Maverick on the left side, Catra on the right side, showing Gargus and Winter Venera. So Gargus going to have an elemental advantage against her. But what else is Catra bringing with her? Bringing the Sorrow and the Curry Wazette. Okay, interesting. So the triple mage comp from Maverick. So we've seen this before. This is just a heavy heavy offensive team just so much magic damage coming all at once it is hard to just live through that the zombie re-raise coming out from skahal um obviously his best tmr there's very little competition for that evasion skills coming out from sorrow gonna get that group evasion up and agility up on the group curious to see if winter venera or curry can be dodgy we've seen mage and x do it before in season one as the grace of eternal friendship comes out from gargas this is the more the merrier tmr coming out from winter venera so that's a very nice uh use here critical evasion and shell on the team frost Maw barrage comes out decent damage onto both units does over half to both skahal and salir a nice start here by Catra. And uh, Sarl's going to get his Courage online. The double Frostbite lands, probably not a huge deal because both of these units have a ton of starting AP. But it could matter if the fight drags on. Both are going to channel spells here, though. And so is Gargas. This is going to be a triple combo right in a row. What happens? Thundaga hits both units. Um, Salir has guaranteed hit in the first few turns of battle. Windlash goes off, hits Winter Venera. And the triple hits from the mages crucially for catra sorrow dodges the skahal or else this fight would have been just over curry comes in with the shadow binds and kills 
Skahal brings his re-raise. Can Ka uh, Katra's Sorrow remove Skahal here? Yes, he can. Helm Splitter, double kill on both Salir and Skahal. This is looking really good for Katra, to be honest. Gargus, who does he go for? It gets reflexed by Curry. Is this an AoE? Yes, it is. Does it hit Sorrow? No, it doesn't. That guy is really dodgy. Uh, Gargus, you normally don't build accuracy because he has guaranteed hits. But if he goes for one of the AoEs that doesn't have it, chances of hitting are low. Falcon Slash, not a ton of damage. That Black Rose Helena TMR barrier really working for Gargus. What is he going to do? Is he go for Curry again? This one does not get reflexed. Can he kill him? Yes, he can. It is now a 1v1. But this is going to be tough for Maverick here. I think Catra might take this. Just the auto attack removes Gargus. And yeah, that is a quick early 1-0 lead for Catra on Maverick. Um, I will say, I think that reflex was the difference. I Well, actually, you know what? I say that, and I don't think it was. Because Sorrow had Courage online. So let's say that reflex does hit. Because I don't think Curry hit again after he reflexed. I don't think. Which means it probably wouldn't have mattered. I think this fight, Catra still would have won with one health on Sorrow. I think that would have been the difference. Hard to say, uh, but either way, big win for Catra. We'll see if uh, Maverick has something in response for game two. I think that triple mage comp can win. I think the biggest thing is you have to be able to hit Sorrow with everything. Thundaga Disposer missed him. If that hit, the fight was just over, and Maverick would have won for sure. So maybe he just builds accuracy to try and make that happen. Maybe just shifts the units around so that uh, Skahal maybe hits an energy buster instead. Let's go ahead and jump into game two and see what these guys did. Game number two between Maverick and Catra. To me, it's looking like the exact same teams. That is a huge magic attack stat from Maverick and a huge attack stat from Catra. The same two units showing... Well, I think uh, Gargus was showing last time, and this time it was Skahal. But yeah, it looks like it's the exact same comps. So the fact that the units aren't even in the same order tells me that Maverick probably sw switched his position a bit, which yes, he did. So this is the Dark Fina TMR coming out on Salir. I think he might have done this last time, but I didn't call it out. Zombie Transformation coming out on Skahal, again, getting that re-raise up. He's got plenty of damage, he just needs to be able to live longer. And Sorrow of again going for evasion skills, so... Not really anything different up to this point from Catra. Just a slight position change from Maverick. How is this going to change the fight? We'll have to see. Winter of an Era going good fortune. Again, that uh, more the merrier TMR. A very, very good one when you're going up against Magic. Curry goes Frost Mob Barrage again. Very similar to the last fight. Good AoE damage on both Skahal and Salir. I don't know, man. Did Maverick make enough adjustments to change the outcome of this fight? What does Salir have? She should have a guaranteed hit here. The first three turns of her battle are guaranteed hits. And three casts. What is different from last time? Bolt Surge. So that is different, I believe. Last time she hit Thundaga. Windlash. I'm not sure this is better. Although Thundaga Disposer, it hits the Curry this time. So he double kills. It is now 1v3. That is the biggest difference. I don't know if that was Catra's change. Or Maverick's change, but either way, Curry got caught out with a double kill from Sorrow. The re-raise is on Skahal. The thing is, though, Skahal and Gargus both have guaranteed hits. As long as Skahal is running Staff Mage sub, this is probably Maverick's fight to lose. If he's running Time Mage, he could lose it. Bursting Light goes 4497. Is this Energy Buster? I have to think it is. Yes, it is. So this will proc Courage, 6730. Sorrow, can you double kill them right here? You're going to have to debilitate encounter. It gets dodged. Strike of Ruin. Kills the Skahal. Does not kill Gargus. I think this is Maverick's win in game two here. This should be an unavailable pain. Yes, it is. Takes him out 4403. And a couple of high octane fights. Um, the biggest difference there in game two compared to game one. I don't even think it was the reflex. I think it was just the fact that that Thundaga caught out. Um, Curry right away on the first one. Um, Curry was a little further back, I think, in the first fight. So I think that was probably the biggest difference there. So interested to see here. Now, does Catra just go back for the same team? Again, switch his positioning. The The biggest difference is just Curry needs to live, right? Like if Curry gets a, another hit off, he probably wins that. But GG's, man. This series has been really good so far. We're heading to a game three right out of the gate for the Heinler division. I'm always excited for three game series. Let's jump into it. The final game of this series, we've got the same stats coming out. A slightly lower attack, I think, from Catra. Actually, that might be the same. I'm not entirely sure. 
but I'm pretty sure that these are the same three units on both sides. They've been both very, very close games. Both teams have won a game themselves. What is the positioning here? So I believe this is the same from Maverick as game two, not as game one. This definitely looks different from Catra, though. Like, this is definitely different. I could see Curry and Winter Venera out to the left, which they were not last time. So does this change things? He runs way over to the side to get the evasion skills buff up. So still same buff rotation, but I think he's just trying to avoid that Thundaga on the second turn from Skahal hitting Curry. With this positioning, I think he should be able to do that. But again, the same buff rotation. It is all about positioning here. What does Curry have? Should go for a Frostmaw. No, he goes for Sharpshoot. That actually only did 2k to Gargus. Not a lot of damage. Considering that is an elemental advantage, I am shocked at how well Gargus took that. Obviously, he has the shield online, but still. And Gargus charging a spell is... I think this is going for Curry. He one-shot Curry last time. Can he do it again? Oh, I got reflexed. Windlash goes. Gonna drop the area attack resist, but... That reflex might be big. Thundaga Disposer dropping the lightning resist on Winter Venera. She actually gets to go this time and does a ton of damage. Last time she got chained down, she did a lot here. This looks actually pretty good for Catra. Another Shadow Bind and it kills Skahal. He has re-raise. But Sorrow goes before him. Can Sorrow reach Skahal? That is the question here. I don't know if he can. He can. Strike of Ruin takes out Skahal. This is Catra's fight to lose 100%. Skahal is the biggest threat here. Bolt Surge does a lot of damage. I mean, I don't want to count out Gargus. He is a very strong unit. Aragorn Disposer, but I think that got dodged by Sorrow. It did. One shots the Curry. But again, because Curry reflexed earlier, he couldn't go up and just do a Bursting Light. He went for Aroga to try and hit Curry as well. Godly Pummel from Winter Venera. She's putting in some work this fight. Yeah, I just don't know how Gargus wins this 1v2. This might be a big upset from Catra. Grease Lightning comes out, that limit break. His own version of Omni Slash, 3408, removes the buff. Gargus still holds on. I don't think he can remove Courage, though. He might be able to kill both. No, he's not even close to killing Winter Venera. She is a very good magic tank, actually. Discontinuum, plus one, comes out from Sorrow. Kills the Gargus, and Catra takes the series in three games. Um, a really nice upset by him. We saw a similar one um, in the Rondal division with King Delita getting the win. Um, so now Catra moves up to six points, so he is right in the middle of stuff. Maverick will be sitting at eight points, so it should make the standings really, really interesting for this division. But we've got four more series. Hats off to both of these players. Let's go check out the next series uh, for today. Matchup number two for you guys today. We've got on the left side, Jebba of the Guild Rebirth, coach of the Sappers, versus Spike of our Guild Thunder Gods, coach of Bebop's crew. Currently for the standings, Jebba sitting with two points and Spike with four. Both of these teams kind of um, desperate for a win here. A win would really, really help them uh, going into that kind of like halfway point of the season of having a chance to make playoffs. A loss, you're not out of it, but it's going to be really, really tricky. So we'll have to see what happens here let's take a look at the rosters first of all on Jabba's side we've got Perrine we've got Mashri Queen of Horn Urel Resnick Stern Victoria Marial Ravis Ravelka and Ramada on the right side Spikes Bebop's crew we've got Oberon we've got Resnick the Hoppy Celis Garvel Luel Raldor Phoebe Adelard Little Leela and Mish honestly up to this point for Jabba I would say star of the show is Perrine. Even though she does have a two and four record, she has managed to pick up six kills and a couple assists for him. Uh, we did see kind of a, a new kind of format from him. I think it was last week where he brought out the Resnick and Stern together. Will we see that again or does he pivot back to something like Perrine, uh, Victoria Ramada? We'll have to see. We've also seen him pull out Revelka. Um, I'm being curious to see what he brings against Spike's team. Especially because he can go evade with Resnick the Hoppy. Only the 1-4 in four record, but we did see her pop off in one game versus Jesus LBL. Oberon's always a very strong unit with that 5-2-4 KDA currently. He's got a number of different options, and obviously we can never forget about Luel. She is absolutely, absolutely a beast. And uh, I'll be curious to see what these guys bring out. So let's go ahead and jump into the game and see what they did. All right, guys, game number one of Spike versus Jabba. We've got Luel and Marial showing here. 
Very, very interesting. So Mariel a, uh, can function as a magic tank. A lot of times when Jebaw does this, he brings dual MRs. He is doing that this time. So he's bringing Mariel, Ravelka, and Perrine. Oh, Perrine has definitely been his hardest show. carry to this point. And uh, interesting from Spike, he's going Luel, Garvel, and Phoebe. So going some time, main, time mage action versus a couple of bulky mage units. Not versus, along with a couple of bulky mage units. Excuse me. Preen's going to go and get her buff off. Chi Barrier coming up from Revelka. That new Energist uh, job upgrade also gives crit evasion. And while unit resist is going to go up on the entire party, Luel's going to also catch some earth attack up. I imagine this is probably a haste coming out from Phoebe. Limiter off comes out. Effect range up, agility up. The effect range really not going to do anything from Mariel. But the agility up will be nice to speed her up. And Fury Surge, Garvel's own TMR coming out on turn two here. So he's going to have a lot of magic attack resist piercing. So it's going to make Mariel's job a lot harder to tank that magic damage. And Perrine, just so many good buffs. She's got two really good uh, AoE buffs that she can get off. And this is the Dark Fina TMR coming out for uh, Jebos Revelka. So doing a similar thing as Garvel's. Gets that magic attack resist piercing rate up. Sorrow's TMR coming out on the well. Haste, haste up. Hate down. An excellent TMR. Now we should finally join the fight here. Crash Edge. Interesting. I, I am shocked that she went for that. I believe that is a physical slash attack. That is from the Leviathan um, VC. Good God, Garvel. 11,000 damage. Wow. So much for a magic tank. She got absolutely obliterated. What is Luel charging here? Revelka's going to have her chance to do some damage back. Deflagration Blast. Actually, really respectable damage on the Luel. Not bad against Garvel. If uh, if she can kind of thin him out before uh, Perrine comes in, I think that was only 1,500. Man, spike building, like, strike resistance? That was not a lot. Even with his barrier, that is incredibly impressive to tank that much up by Garvel. He did get some increased area attack resist in his MA2. Lord, this Garvel is on steroids right now. 11,000 damage from his jamming thrust. Curses comes in threes. This is the VC ability coming out from Luel. Perrine's a beast, but I don't know how she's going to pull out this 1v3. She would have to double kill right here. And she's not going to be able to do that when Garvel is catching a Curata. Can she at least get rid of Luel? No, she goes subjugating fist actually into the Garvel. So a single target attack doing significantly more than the AoE. Like I said, Garvel has a lot of AoE resist, especially with his new upgrade that he got. That Curses comes in threes again. What does Phoebe do? Does she go for a heal? She's going for a full life. If this lands, it lands. And uh, yeah, this is this is over. Garvel comes back. Auto attacks the Perrine. Perrine's going to drop. And uh, a clean victory coming out from Spike. Um, an impressive game one win. I am shocked at how much damage Garvel did. He did 11,000 twice, both to Revelka and Mariel. I definitely expect some sort of switch coming out from Jebba. I did not expect that kind of damage. Um, yeah, really impressive stuff coming out from Spike. I think if I'm him, I'm probably running the exact same thing. And uh, we'll have to see what Jebba comes with a switch to, to try and adjust for that. Because as of right now, um, he's definitely got to change something. So we'll see what he does and check out game two. All right, guys, I said he had to change something, and Jebla did, most certainly. He's got Ramada showing in slot one, so I like the fact that he switched up his team. Obviously, didn't work in game one, so he's going with a different strategy here. And so he's going Ramada, Perrine, Victoria. I love this comp. It's a very, very aggressive comp with three physical damage dealers. And uh, the Chi Barrier coming out from Garvel, again, with that job upgrade getting crit evasion, it's just uh, even stronger than it already, wa already was. Which is very good. Bell's coming online for Victoria. Marine probably going to go for her AoE buff. Yeah, Greater Domain of Water. Gives area attack resist up, slash and pierce attack resist up, and a self heal. The slash and pierce attack resist, not going to matter in this fight. But the AoE resist and the self heal obviously will. Earth and Invocation again coming out. Phoebe should be channeling another haste. And what does Ramada do here? Keenblade. Okay, so getting the CT up on the team. A nice move to try and get that team to act faster. And as you can see, Perrine actually jumped over Garvel in the turn order. But actually, with the speed force, I think... Oh, no, she did go next. I thought Garvel jumped her back. And he's she's going to duplicate her buff. She's going to do it again, but now she's got it on the whole party. Fury Surge coming out once again. 
What can Ramada do? I think she can probably reach. Dreadspear dive. 2395. Not a ton, but removes the buff. That should remove the magic attack versus piercing on Garvel. Which would be really, really good for Jabba. Should hopefully not take 11,000 damage from him this time. And Dragon's Kin, the Protect, not going to do a whole lot, but should get some more damage up from the other buffs that it gives her. I don't think Garvel's low enough for a heal. Yeah, he's not. Speed Force again, coming out from Phoebe. Spirit Blaster, much better tanked by Ramada than Marial took it last time. 5774. Raging Water's coming up, so Perrine is ready to go with her 10,600 health. Law of Geo Absorption, this probably kills. Yes, it does. 6286. But Victoria is going to go next, and we have seen her put in work before. I expect a Frost Reaver or a Limit Break. It's a Limit Break. Enchanting Trap. Can she land a charm? It actually goes into Phoebe. It would have landed the charm, but Phoebe actually dies. So uh, a kill is probably better than a charm. It is now a 2v2. Can Jebba bring this to a game three? Luel's going to channel something. Garvel probably going to hit the Victora. No, actually going for Perrine because Victora's got the 100% shield, I assume, because he does more damage here than he went for Perrine. Perrine going subjugating fists like last time just barely doesn't kill the Garvel. Does that matter? Devitalizing Glint breaks barriers, one-shots the Victora. Luel is an absolute monster. Enough of this, though. The counterattack does a lot of damage and gets the CT up. The uh, Curses comes in threes, dropping the unit attack resist. Does that CT up matter on the counterattack? She gets it again. Enough of this. Another counter takes out the Garvel. Man, we have seen so many crucial reactions come through both in the Rundall video and this week. Upsurge takes out Luel and Jebba picks up the win. Holy cow. Those, the double counter. I 100% won that fight for, for Jebba. Um... We've seen a lot of turnarounds, in, like I said, in the Rundle video and this one up to this point with some of these counters, most of them being Reflex. Uh, but that one, yeah, Perrine put an absolute show on there. She hard carried that match, or that game rather. But we're going to go into a game three. Um, does Jabba bring the exact same team? I will say, if I were him, I'd probably switch something up, whether or not that's like positioning or something else. Just because of the simple fact that I think a luck was a little bit on his side. I don't think he wins that if he doesn't get those counters, but I'm not entirely sure. So does Spike switch up, the, switch up something? Does Jebba switch up something? We'll have to go ahead and find out. But let's jump into game three. Final game of this series. Looks like the same units. Uh, we've got Spike's Luel showing, and we've also got Jabba's Ramada showing. So I expect probably the exact same teams. We'll have to find out here. And it is. It is all six of the same units here. Any position changes? I don't believe so. I believe this is the same from Spike. He probably thinks the same thing is that, like, hey, he got a little unlucky. This is a switch off from, switch up from Jebba, though. I think he says, hey, I don't need quite as much time to sit back and buff. Let's get into the fight a little sooner. Greater Domain of Water comes up. Again, that AoE resist going to be nice. In the same buff rotations as the first couple games here. Earth and Invocation, Unit Attack Resist, obviously, obviously helpful. How will the Keen Blade CT up work? Perrine jumps turn order. She is just behind Phoebe now. Which again, this should be... Yeah, this is a speed force, not a haste. And Perrine is online. She has both of her buffs that she wants. She is sitting at 11,000 health right now. Which is just crazy to say out loud. Sharp Spear... Is Ramada in danger, though? I think Garvel reaches. Spirit Blaster does not one-shot. I don't know if Luel can reach from this range. Victoria should be able to reach Garvel. Can she charm him? She actually goes for Frost Reaver. Does not one-shot the Phoebe. And she slow counters. Oh, no. That is bad for Jebba. That is rough. Phoebe sitting with 649 health. I imagine she's probably healing herself. I think Luel actually can reach... Unless she's going for Victora. This might be Devitalizing Glint. Yes, it is. Damage caps again. Breaks that barrier. Luel is such a counter to Victora for that reason. And Garvel's going to pick up the kill on Ramada. Spike looking to take this Game 3 victory. Perrine is a beast, but I don't know if she can 1v3, man. Vortex kick. Not enough damage. The healing power down might be good if Phoebe tries to go for a heal. But we'll have to see. Luel can't reach. 
If Jabot's going to win this, it is by the units running in by themselves 1v1 over again. Pretty much just like a game of League of Legends where everybody says, hey, it's my turn to die next. That's the only way she can win this. Jamming thrust, 6200 damage. She heals back up. I just don't see a way she wins this unless she gets multiple counters in a row. She has to kill in this hit. Subjugating fist. She does do that. Garvel drops, but Phoebe still has access to full life. I think she can probably reach from here. It looks like that's what she's channeling. Padfoot comes out from Luel. This full life is going to go off first. As long as this connects, I think this is game over. And it does connect. It looks like Spike is probably going to take this game three victory. The haste from Luel. She's going to go next. Curses comes in threes. Does not kill. Garwell should be able to clean this up with some sort of attack. He still has 115 AP. Enough of this. 5,700 damage from the counter. It's not going to be enough, but that is incredibly impressive for just a standard counter attack to do that much damage. Almost 6k. Just crazy. Hats off to both of these players. Um, obviously, it ended up in a three-man versus zero-man situation, but the fight wasn't uh, a three for zero, like one-sided. It was a full life, obviously, helped out. But a great series from both of these players. Up to this point, we've had two series in this video, and they've both been three games. They've both been bangers. It was really, really fun. I'm hoping to get some more of those this video. Let's go ahead and check out the third one and see what happens. Matchup number three, guys. We've got Ram9 of the guild Howl. Shout out to JB79. Uh, Ram9 mentioned last week in his shoutcast that it's actually JB's guild. So huge shout out to JB. Awesome content creator. But Ram9 is coach of the Rock Boys versus, of course, Jesus LBL of the guild Get Schwifty and the Straw Hats. Uh, this matchup should be really, really good. Nine points for Ram9 currently. Currently sitting in third place going into the week. And Jesus LBL right in the thick of it as well with seven points. If Jesus picks up the win, he would jump Ram9 in the standings. And if Ram9 wins, man, he is just ever so close to kind of securing that top four spot. So it should be really, really interesting here. Ram9, he's got Eliza. He's got Eliza. Say that 10 times so fast. Chunak, Fryevia, Ketone, Miranda, Kilfe, Balo, Uni, and Severo. And of course, on Jesus' side, we've got Starlight, Elena. We've got Sadali, Black, Rose, Helena, Locke, Titus, Rachez, Yuna, Cyrell, Ryryu, and Mia. For Ram 9, um, he's ran that uh, pairing of the Missile Girls a couple of times with, you know, one of his 30 cost units. He has Balo, Uni, Severo, all filling kind of that different role for 30 cost. But the star of the show is absolutely Miranda. She's got a 5-1 win-loss record with an 8-3-8 and eight KDA. Kilfay has been very strong for him. And what we've seen is uh, what I thought going into the season that double missile comp would be really strong. To be honest, the carry of his team so far has been that triple UR combo where he is able to pair Miranda and Kilfay with one of those 80 costers. We also did see Chunak from him one game. Chunak kind of popped off, so that was kind of cool to see too. Would not be surprised at all to see Triple UR again coming from him. On Jesus' side, he's always got strong Light Evade options with the Starlight Elena and Locke. We've seen him put in a lot of work with Sadali. Yuna has come to play, and uh, we've seen the Water Comp only one time, uh, but would love to see some more action from that as well. The only ones we haven't seen yet are Ryru and Black Rose Helena. Will we see them again, or will we see them for the first time this week? Uh, I don't know. We'll have to find out. But let's go ahead and jump into the series and see what they brought. Game number one here between Ram9 and Jesus LBL. We've got the Fryevia showing. We've got the Mia showing. So from Jesus, is this going to be Light Evade, or does he go with something like Sadali? It is Light Evade. So going Starlight, Elena, Locke, and Mia, and Ram9, as I said in the matchup preview... His triple UR teams have been incredibly impressive. So he's going Kilfe, Miranda, Fryevia. Miranda at 70 cost is just an absolute steal in this format. Going with the Starlight Ellen at TMR on Kilfe, a smart option seeing as you're going into full light. Not full light, technically there's Mia, but we I don't know if that really counts. The Immortal Spirit comes out from Miranda. What does Fryevia do? She walks straight forward. Spellveil Blade. Is that a 100% hit? I think it might be. That's a lot of damage, 3,700 AP Hunt plus. That is not a lot of damage. Locke does not get to really get buffs off here. Sweet Support coming out from Mia will get that agility up, but I don't think this is how Jesus wanted this fight to start. I think he wanted to play this a little slower. The Limit Break coming out from Elena. How much damage does this do? This needs to do a lot. So what do you have here? Not a lot. Priavia tanked that extremely well. Miranda is still over half health, but can lock chain it. 
AP hunt plus 5,000. That's enough to kill Miranda, but she holds on because of courage. She has a guaranteed hit in her kit with the dispelling thrust. Does she go for it? No, she's channeling water. Is this going for Mia? That is a mistake by Miranda, I think. Energy Blaster comes out from Killfei. One shot's the lock. That is not a mistake. Killfei come into play. Waterga does not kill Mia. Only does about half. Uh, well tanked by Mia, to be honest. I know her best resistance is magic. She takes a couple of hits. She says, hey, Elena, I'm trying to buy as much time as I can, but I don't know how she's possibly going to 1v3 this. The other team has too many guaranteed hits in their kit. Miranda's going to drop, get the agility up on Elena, but I don't think she's going to lap anyone. She's not. This is going to be an Energy Blaster. An upgraded version of Energy Buster pops the Courage. I think Fryavia can take this kill. No, she's going to channel her full life, isn't she? Crystal Shine Bright. A double hit. She's running out of AP, though, too. There's just no way out of this. Full life's going to go off on Miranda. And uh, now this is really, really over. Miranda's probably going to take this kill. Yep, the Spelling Thrust comes out. The Guaranteed Kill... And uh, a very impressive game one showing from Ram, Ram 9 here. Two of our better teams in the league, I think. Uh, but an impressive showing. This three-man UR squad with these like bulky mages is so hard to deal with. They're all just quite tanky for their cost limit and for how much damage they do. Um, it's just, it's really hard to beat. I don't think we've seen many teams keep up with it. So what does Jesus bring out here? Because I don't think Light of Eight is the play into this comp. Uh, maybe if he brings something else, but I, I don't think that's the answer here. I think all three units, I think, have guaranteed hits, unless Fryavia is that accurate, but I think that attack is probably a guaranteed hit. I don't use her, so I don't know, but I have to imagine that. So let's go ahead and check out game two and see what he Jesus ends up changing to try and make this a three-game series. Game number two here, and Jesus looks like he's going with his water squad. He's only brought this out one time, but I'm excited to see it. I believe this is probably the Titus Rage has Yuna. If I had to guess, it is. It is Titus Rachez Yuna. He brought this out one other time, uh, I believe, versus Spike. And almost won the game, but Resnick the Hoppy hard carried that match. Saintly Wall, interestingly enough, came coming out from Titus. And it looks like on Ram 9's side, he is going with the Alaya Fryavia Balo comp. I'm curious about the Balo, um, just considering Fryavia is also a tank. But maybe he thinks, if I've got two tanks, Alaya can do enough damage to take everybody out. Interesting strategy. March of the Dragon Princess comes out from Elias. Sweet support comes in, out from Yuna to get that agility up. And also the Banishing Barrier was played by the uh, Rachez. So she has a nice magic shield. It'll be good against the Fryavia, but won't do anything for the Alaya. Keen Blade coming out from Balo. So nice way to, you know, use 30 costs and just get Keen Blade off. I believe she just used that buff for the second time here. What does Titus have, though? He didn't end up using Hastuga. He just went in for the Saintly Wall. Taunting Blade, 4,800. Not bad into Fryavia, honestly. She's a very good tank, so... Can Rach has Chain? She cannot. She not, cannot get there yet. Keen Blade, interestingly enough, I honestly didn't even realize Rach has wore, like, uh, armor. I thought she wore cloth. I didn't even know she could do Keen Blade, but that is good to know. Spellveil Blade comes out from Fryavia. And man, 4,300 damage is not bad from the tank. This is probably Abia putting in some work this series. Balo not really done anything yet, but I believe he just used Immortal Spirit. Going to walk into the fight here. Yuna probably going to channel a heal. A heal or a re-raise. I don't know if she used a re-raise already. I missed it. Heaven Splitter comes out and does very respectable damage. Titus, can you take her out? Yes, you can. Sphere Shot. So Fryavia down. This is actually looking pretty good for Jesus here. They were just able to chain her down before Elia did anything. What can Elia do here, though? The team is pretty spread out. She lands an armor bore on all three of them. They're in a perfect line. The fact that that skill can hit everybody, that's crazy. Yuna drops. Rachez takes a ton of damage. Titus does a lot of damage, but now he is out of AP. He only has six. Rachez needs to kill her. Drain Evocation comes out 64, 67, and heals her almost to full. And holy crap, Jesus is going to win this fight. Uh, that looked really bad for a second when Elia chained on basically all three units. But they managed to pick her off. Um, I don't know if Bela was running any hate or if they just couldn't reach him. But they went for a lie instead. Magic Buster comes out. That's going to proc his courage. And uh, poor Bela going to get beat up on here. Titus, what do you have? 
just a standard attack. That'll take him out. We're going to another game three. So far, we are three for three in this division on uh, three game series, which is exciting as hell. I do wonder for Ram 9, um, I do wonder what the thought process was with bringing Balo. I know he has multiple other 30 cost units. I think he has Severo on his team, if I'm not mistaken. If I were him and I was bringing Fryavi as a tank, I probably would have bought brought Fryavia or uh Severo as a damage dealer but what the heck do I know he's doing better than I am <laughs> in his league and uh I'm sure he knows how to run his team better than I do so that being said does he just go straight back to the triple UR comp because that worked very very well for him in game one it has worked for well for him all season if I'm Jesus I'm probably expecting him to go there do you win with your water comp here, or do you have something else in the bag that beats that? Because I don't think Light Evade beats it. I'm curious to see what happens in Game 3, what these two teams bring out. Let's go check it out. All right, so Game 3 here. Interestingly enough, I think this is the Light Evade team from Jesus, and I think this is the same team that Ram9 brought in Game 1. I'm not entirely sure um, what Jesus' thought process was. Maybe he thought Ram9 wouldn't go back to the Triple UR comp, but it is Light Evade versus Triple UR. Last time, it was a very one-sided fight. What is Jesus doing differently to try and change it? So immediately gets the Courage off on Elena. Can he get the re-raise on lock? Yes, he can, because he did not do this last time. So this is at least a much better start for him. This may be more of a competitive match at this point. So Kilfay going to channel something. Miranda cannot reach on the Dispelling Thrust. She's going to pop her own Courage. And where is Mia? That is what I want to know. I can't see her on the map, so she's got to be in the bottom right corner here somewhere. Hate up, going to go on Fryavia, so she's ready to tank. And uh, going with Mia way on the other side, this is kind of a similar strategy to what I ran. I think this is Bowtie Mia, because I think she has four movement, not three. Um, which means she's only moving three here. She probably has Bowtie, so she has Hate. So Jesus trying to draw everybody away to the other side. The only issue I'm seeing here is that Mia is so damn slow. These other two units are really fast. They're going to lap her. They're going to walk forward. And Ram Knight might not be able to reach Mia. They might still be hitting the evade units. But they have extra lives, so who knows. A massive buff coming up from Killface. She is walking towards Mia, though. This strategy might actually work out for Jesus. A Spell Veil Blade. Again, I think this is probably a guaranteed hit. I haven't seen it miss yet. The Spelling Thrust. That for sure is a guaranteed hit. Remove the buff. Get rid of Jesus. Uh, Jesus' lock. He does have re-raise up, though. So as long as Mia can tank or take a hit... Oh, she's walking towards Elena. That movement was very awkward because she moved to the side because Fryavia has hate. Iridescent Blade comes out and Regenerator comes out. I don't know that this damage mattered at all. The chain will be nice, though. The Slash Chain. Steelheart from Mia does not land. Locke should be able to chain here, though. I think this is a times three Light and Slash Chain. This should do actually quite a bit of damage, I think. Sky Mirage Dive. 5591. Man, Fryevia is a beast with a massive chain, still only took 5500. And Kilfay Energy Blaster does not one shot the Mia, crucially. Does not kill uh, Elena down to her courage either. Miranda, who's she going for? She goes for, I think, Waterga? And interesting. Maybe Mia doesn't have Bowtie because I think she only took one hit. Oh, man. Oh, the water go comes out as well. Prismatic Punishment comes out from Elena. I think this is a win for Ram 9, unless Starlight Elena can do a ton of damage here. I just don't see it. This triple UR comp is just so damn strong. A nice chain, but she's not going to be able to follow up with herself. There's going to be two hits coming in. Three hits, excuse me, before she goes again. Spell Veil Blade. Yeah, that's got to be a guaranteed hit. 100%. Energy Blaster probably going to come out from Kilfay. Yes, it is. It's going to take her down. And Ram 9 with another convincing win here in Game 3. So he ends up taking the series 2-1. to one. Um, Hats off to both players. Very well played on both sides. I do wonder for Jesus' side if he was expecting a different team comp from Ram 9. Or if maybe in his own testing he had better success against this team. But I just think with so many guaranteed hits on the other side, it is very, very difficult for Light of Aid to win. I'm going to note real quick. I, I don't know if Mia has four movement. She might only have three, so she might not have bow tie. I figured she did because of how far apart that um, Jesus was running her on the other side. It's possible she was running something like Vow of Love, though, too, in a sub slot. If that was the case, she could have been running only two hate rather than three. 
The thing to note with hate, right? If you guys don't know, for anybody who's watching out there, essentially, if you have hate, uh, every time you do damage to the opponent, you lose two hate. So you can only hate, um, or sorry, every time you take damage, you lose two hate. So Mia took a hit from, I believe it was Fryevia. It might have been, actually, I think it was Kilfay. Did not get one shot. And then Miranda started channeling her water gun. So even if she did have bow tie, I wonder if the AI thinks because the water gun's already channeling that that's the second hit going into Mia and the hate has already dropped to zero. I actually don't know how that works. If the hate drops once the damage happens or once the channel starts, I'd be very curious to, to test that out and see how that works. But my guess is she was not running bow tie. I don't know if she, I think she has the option of having four movement because I think she has the floor. Either way, I don't know. I don't know uh, what what exactly the lineup was from Jesus. I'd be very curious to dig into that and see exactly how that played out. But props to both players here. Two really good players. Um, Jesus is going to move up to eight points, and Ram 9 is going to be sitting with 12. So he's going to be in very, very good position coming into next week's uh, series. We've got another couple of series for you guys um, left. We are so far three for three on three games. Can we get five for five? Let's go for it. Let's find out. Let's hop into match four. Matchup number four this week. We've got Zathria of the Guild Lapis, coach of the Ghostbloods, going up against McCrane of the Guild Hydra and coach of the Materia Hunters. Uh, on the left side here, Zathria currently sitting at five points, so he's right kind of in the middle of trying to hunt for those playoffs. And uh, McCrane, an undefeated record, 4-0. I'll be straight up, uh, McCrane's team has probably been the most fun for me to watch of any of the teams in the two divisions. He's just got so much different stuff to bring out. Like, it seems like he can just pair any three units together and just succeed extremely well with them. So it's incredibly fun to watch. Huge shout out to McCrane as a player. And um, I don't think I've mentioned this before, but McCrane actually does have a YouTube channel. Um, I will post it in the like uh, description of the video below, um, assuming that McCrane is cool with that. I hope he's cool with that. But I know he makes some different like PvP content. He also, I believe, makes like guides for like selection quest stuff and stuff like that. So if you guys are at all curious about any of that, go ahead and check out his channel. Uh, so anyway, let's get into the preview screen of these two teams. For Zathria, uh, we've got Sylvie, we've got Knight of Rune Stern, Snow, Golbez, Whisper, Laswell, Fina, Shadowlinks, Valade, and Surges. And I'm on the Materia Hunter's side. We've got Glacella Flagbearer, Cloud, Summer Elsie, Sweetheart Eldira, Regular Eldira, Lemure, Kane, McLeod, Dario, and Naya. Honestly, for Zathria's side, I'm not sure what to expect. He's brought out a lot of different team comps. Um, he's used basically every unit on his roster except Valade. So who knows what he's going to bring out. And I could say the exact same thing for McCrane. That guy has literally used every unit on his team except for Eldira. So both teams, only one unit hasn't been used. You love to see that flexibility. You love to see teams bringing out a lot of different stuff. Uh, it makes the matches really interesting. Um, for Zathria, would love to see some more Golbez. Would love to see some more Knight of Ruinstern. Shadow Lynx was a cool uh, thing to see. I believe it was last week. McCrane. I'm not even going to begin to speculate what this guy's going to bring out. Everything he brings out seems to turn to gold and it seems to turn out well. Can Zathria finally end his winning streak in this series? We're going to go ahead and jump into the games and find out and see what happens. All right, guys, I said this before. I think McCrane's teams are probably the most fun to watch for me. But you know what else is fun to watch? Friggin' Golbez. Zathria is bringing out Golbez. I am super excited about this. He has only brought him out in one other series so far. A unit that I think was kind of slept on for a while. I'm excited to see what he can pull out here. So he has Golbez, Whisper, Laswell, and McCrane going with a probably somewhat evasion team. Yep, gaining that evasion buff up with Sweetheart Eldira. A unit that is not used all the time, but McCrane has put in some absolute work with her before. Also bringing that Summer Elsie and Naya, and we know how good Naya is. Boon of the Line coming out from Golbez, getting area attack resistance up. How well can Whisper tank damage in this fight? We'll have to see. Divine Shelter coming up. So many nice buffs for herself. I shall help you sleep forever. And what is Summer Elsie going? I think this is probably the uh, Invocation of Water or whatever it's called. Water Invocation. Aurora Blessings coming out. That's going to be a nice Dark Resistance buff on the team. Tidal Call. That is what it's called. Water Attack uh, up. Unit Attack Resist up. And Bell's going online for Sweetheart Eldira, so she's ready to go. Another physical shield and protect. That'll be good against Laswell 
and I guess kind of for Whisper as well. Golbez won't really care about it so much. And last while going with Dragon's Kin. So just many, many buffs. Both teams kind of set up on opposite corners of the map here. So it should take a little while for the fight to kind of start or kind of engage. I think this is actually kind of bad for Zathria because Golbez typically is better the earlier in the fight. Uh, just the way uh, one of his passives works. But we'll have to see here. The Limit Break coming up from Sweetheart Odira. This goes on to the tank for Whisper. So this might be good for Zathria. The fact that the Limit Break's only going on the tank. How much does this do? Not a ton. 1261 drops the CT and gets her own CT up, which is always good. But the fact that the tank with regen only took 1200, a very good start for Zathria here. What can Laswell do? Elemental disadvantage, but he's going to go probably horizontal jump. And Summer Elsie, I don't think can reach anything. She starts channeling something again. Nimble movement. Okay, so she's going to be able to go wherever she pleases at this point. And Golbez channeling something. I think this is probably his dark barrier. I don't think he has used this yet. I don't think he can reach anyone. Horizontal jump misses, though. The Sweetheart Eldira is dodgy. Laswell can be as well. Blinding Trinity, a nice little chain built up, and the blind comes out. Not a lot of damage. Again, just regenning through all of it. But she doesn't do anything. She just sits there, stands still. Ooh, man, that is rough for Zathria. And Fatal Bloom comes out. Last one misses again. This sweetheart Eldira, we've seen her put in work before, and she continues to do so. She's just so dodgy. And uh, just refreshing the Dark Resistance. So Summer Elsie is going to be hard to take down as well. Whisper's just going to go Divine Shelter. She can't do anything else at this moment. But she's going to at least proc her refresh again, or her regen. And she's back to full health. But at some point, she's going to lose hate. Or people are going to stack up next to her. Summer Elsie is going to go for an attack here. Twisting Shield Breaker. 62, 89. A lot of damage onto the last well. Law of Geo Assimilation, a good AoE, does good damage to Golbez. What can he do here, though? Because he should be able to heal up based on some damage. He goes for the Limit Break, but Sweetheart Ildira turns towards him. That's, we know what that means. That means Ildira's about to dodge this attack. What does it do to Summer Elsie? She's weaker to magic than she is physical. 37-24, that Dark Resist coming in handy. And Whisper, I don't think she can do anything. The blind finally goes away, so she should hopefully at least be able to hit Summer Elsie at some point. Not a lot of damage coming off from Laswell, though. Twisting Shieldbreaker, the AoE. This is going to double kill. This double kills Laswell and Golbez. This chick is just 1v3ing out here. And Naya just comes across and say, Hey, I'll heal you to full health. No problem. Man, McCrane's team continues to be incredibly impressive. Law of Geo Assimilation. It's going to take a little while, but they are slowly going to whittle down this Whisper. Haunting spell. Just a little bit of damage. And we all know the outcome of this fight. It's just how long is it going to take? Whisper is tanking incredibly well. Honestly, if the other two units were more accurate or could have closed the gap faster, Zathria might have won this fight because, like, Whisper is doing her job incredibly well. It's just that they couldn't do any damage to the Sweetheart Odira. So, what does Naya do? Does she have an offensive attack here? I think she does. I think she's going for maybe a Holy or a Shadow Flare or something. No, she goes for Regen. She doesn't have any offensive abilities up. Oh boy, this poor Whisper. She's just getting bullied. Toxic Assault. Does this finally do it? No, but it does get the poison online. I imagine Summer Elsie should pick up the kill here. She's going with the Energy Blast. This is the Valifor Esper. I do wish we could get a full Valifor animation. That would be really cool. But unfortunately, they didn't add that to the game. But a very decisive and convincing win from McCrane in game one here. I mean, his team has just been so damn hard to beat. He's only lost one game all season up to this point. What does Zathria bring out? Um, if I'm him, if I try this team again, I am loading up on my accuracy and luck runes. I'm running accuracy and luck on both Laswell and Golbez. I'm sure you probably want something like agility or something like that, but I don't think you can afford it um, if you're going up against McCrane, just in case he does bring this evasive uh, sweetheart, sweetheart Eldira again. That being said, McCrane changes his comp almost every single time. So if we're, will we see the same thing or not? My guess is probably not, but this team worked very well. So who knows? But let's go ahead and jump into game two and see if Zathria can bring it to a game three. 
Game number two here. We've got Zathrius Golbez still showing, and I think this is the exact same team from McCrane, actually. It might not be. He might just have, like, similar attack and magic levels. I don't remember the exact numbers, but it looks like it might be the same. Did he finally keep his second team, like, right in a row? Because he normally switches it up. He did not. He kept the exact same team. I wonder if Zathri is almost thrown off by this because McCrane normally does keep his same, or normally does switch up his team. But this looks like the exact same setup as last time. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. However, I will say for Zathria, he's on the same side of the map this time. This could be better for him. However, is Golbez going to get out in front? Because Whisper is behind him right now. You kind of want the tank out in front. I, I don't know. I don't know. Golbez might put himself in danger. But he actually just channels something. He doesn't even move. This might have actually been a really big, big brain play by Zathria, actually. Because of the location and the height range, I don't think he can move forward. I think that's why he's sitting there channeling. Oh no, it's because he's going for Umbral Kali in a big AoE. Well, ac actually, in that case, uh, very well played by Zathria. Although he is going to go next because he didn't move, so he's still going to move kind of forward. But that's a very nice buff. Boon of the Lion again. So he's finally going to walk forward. What does Semmer Elsie do? She's going Law of Safeguarding again. So the exact same buff rotation coming out from a crane. And my big question is, with the exact same team up, so he goes accuracy up, so that is a nice change. Is it enough? Was he running accuracy and luck runes already? Did he switch to them? Those are some of the questions that I would have. So Naya, what are you going to do? She starts channeling. She goes for the regen. Making this team even harder to kill than they already are. And uh, the Limit Break comes out. Letter Bomb of Love. This is big because this goes into the last well, not the Whisper. Last time the tank soaked this. So this kills his 100% shield. Gets her CT up. Looking at the turn order here. Does she, she does not jump last well though. So she, uh, last well still goes in front of her. That's big. That is big for Zathria here. What can Summer Elsie do though? Does she get an AoE? Oh no, this looks really bad. Does this hit all three? Dreamy Typhoon comes out. She's going to go sleep while she reads her book. Good damage. That's some good damage on Zathria's team. I don't know about this one. Whisper, you need to separate. So she has hate, but she needs to move out of the way. She doesn't move at all. She stays right there. Regen coming out from Naya. Last wall, what are you going to do? He goes to Zor Sky. He goes for his own limit break. This needs to do a lot of damage for Zathria to have a chance. 2200. That is not a lot. That is not a lot. Summer Elsie, really beefy versus physical units. And I think Eldira's going to take people out here. Blinding Trinity, yeah, kills the last well. And it's just so unfortunate that positioning here with Whisper in the back, the other two units right next to her, she just can't do her job. I mean, you can see how little damage she's taking. Like, she tanks so well, it's just the positioning, right? Like, they needed to move out of the way. And uh, we don't really get to find out whether the accuracy was enough. I don't know if Ildira dodged this or not. I don't think Golbez caught the accuracy buff from last well. And he did not. He takes out the uh, Summer Elsie, which is great. But Sweetheart Ildira still remaining unaffected. Naya's just going to walk up and probably do a full life on Summer Elsie. Just an absolute beast of a 40 cost unit. She has two full life charges. Blinding Trinity comes out again. Gets Golbez very low. And here comes the full life. Whisper's going to go next. She is out of AP. What can she do? She at least moves out of the way of Golbez, but... There's just so little that she can do. What does Golbez do here? Goes for the Meteor. 8,000 damage. Actually one-shot this Summer Elsie. Man, if Naya didn't have uh, two casts of full life, is this is this not over? I think this is over, right? Naya's got another full life cast. What is the timing on this? Can Golbez kill Naya before she gets a full life off? Who is, who is he going for? What does sweet, Sweetheart Eldira do? Blinding Trinity. Oh, it kills the Golbez. I don't know if Golbez was going for Naya or Ildira. If he one-shot the Naya... I don't think it would have mattered, because Eldira just kills the Golbez anyway. 
and uh, Whisper can't hit Ildira. So it would have been over anyway, but it might have made things more interesting. Now to this point, McCrane's just going to get three members back online. Nia's is probably just going to Kuraga the whole team again, and they're slowly going to whittle down Whisper. Another impressive win by McCrane. I will say, I think this team from Zathria, especially with Golbez doing a good amount of damage, had a chance. Um... But it's like, it's so tough, right? Like when you're running a tank, you want to group up your units to try and get some of those AOE buffs off to make everybody really strong. But the problem is when you're running a tank, if those units stay clumped, then the tank really doesn't do anything for you because the units end up getting caught in the AOE anyway. So a tough match. I mean, honestly, I, I can't fault Zathra for anything. McCrane has beat up everybody that he's faced up to this point. He's an incredible player and his team is just, he's got so many different options. You really have no idea what he's going to bring out game to game. So hats off to McCrane, a perfect 5-0 and series record up to this point, sitting up at the top of 15 points. Zathria, uh, better luck next time. Uh, honestly, uh, it was a really, really enjoyable series. Um, we've got one more series for you guys today. Uh, should be a banger. It's got Dr. Dickhead versus Turambar. Dr. Dickhead needs a win to try and keep pace with McCrane in that undefeated streak. Turambar looking to try and uh, stay right around that top four area with a win. So it should be a good one. Let's go ahead and check that one out. All right, guys, the last series of week five, the last series before our supplemental draft, we've got Turambar on the left side of the guild to get Schwifty, coach of the Fire Ferrets, versus Dr. Dickhead of the guild Lapis, coach of the Foolish Mortals. Turambar currently sitting at six points with a two and two record, and Dr. Dickhead undefeated at four and zero with 12 points. A little bit of history between these two teams. Um, Last season, Dr. Dickhead was the first one to take a single game win from Turambar. Turambar was just tearing through the competition. I think he had like five or six wins at the time, uh, but he hadn't dropped a single game. Dr. Dickhead was the first one to win a game against him. Turambar ended up winning the series, but... Uh, can Turambar do the same thing to him? Can Turambar take a game from Dr. Dickhead now that he is the one who is undefeated? We'll have to go ahead and find out in this series here. But let's take a look at the rosters. Turambar with Jaden, Halloween Lucia, Lightning, Orlando, Aerith, Engelbert, Sakura, Elshrush, Slime, and Titus. And Foolish Mortals on the right has Little Leela the Bold, Dark Fina, Ibarra, Astrius, Lucio, Camilo, Minwoo, Seymour, Murmur, and Zazan. Up to this point, Dr. Dickhead has not strayed from his strategy. He has brought the Dark Fina, Little Leela the Bold, and Zazan every game. And you can see it's a perfect 8 0. Nobody has dropped a single game from him. 11 2 3, or 11 2 13 KDA for Little Leela. 11 1 13 KDA for Dark Fina. 2 8 and 22 for Zazan. I mean, this team has just been so damn strong. It's one of those things where he says, hey, you know exactly what I'm bringing and I think I can still beat you with it. So it's just, it's impressive. If anybody could take him down though, Turnbar is a heck of a player and he has Jaden on his side. He also has Sakura on his side. He has some light units who could do a lot of damage to those dark units. Um, and one thing that I will shout out real quick, just looking at this, Little Lilo the Bold has courage. Sakura's Rebel Intention removes Courage, so I would not at all be surprised to see a couple of those units come out from Turambar's side. He always could obviously go the Lightning angle too. I think Lightning or Nor Lightning and Orlando could easily give him a chance against this other team, uh, but it'll be interesting to see what happens. Does Dr. Dickhead just keep going with the Dark Squad until he loses, or does he go for a switch up? Let's go ahead and jump into this final series, and let's get into it. Game number one here between Dr. Dickhead and Turambar. Dr. Dickhead, it looks like he is bringing that same dark squad. He says, dude, until you can beat it, until someone can take it down, I'm not switching. Turambar is showing Titus here. Is he running the, like, Jaden Sakura? That cost would work out perfectly with Titus. I think that's probably his best option into the dark team. I, I have to imagine it is. Rebel Intention, removing Courage. Yep, it is exactly that. It's Jaden, Sakura, Titus versus Dark Fina, Little Lilo the Bold, and Zazan. So what do we got here? Little Lilo's tactical training, slash attack piercing rate, HP recovery when they're low, reaction block rate, such an excellent turn one buff. Dark Fina looks like probably going to channel her re-raise, although it could be the buff that uh, does the like elemental resist. And what is Sakura going to go for here? Curse of the Serpent. So it is her re-raise, area attack resist up. Thunder's Protection. I forgot that Sakura had this. This actually gives dark resist to the party. So another reason to use her. Sweet support coming out from Zazan. And I will say with Sakura, I think she has access to, I think it's Dark Spirit's Blessing or Light Spirit's Blessing, whatever. 
she should actually be able to stack up some dark resistance. Bell's coming out from Little Leela. Interesting. So going with Bell's instead of the Courage. I wonder if that was on purpose. Jamming thrust 11,000 damage onto the Zazan. So Turnbar out to a nice start here. But obviously the two strong carries still alive. And she gets her own TMR off. Dark Fina is locked and loaded, ready to do some damage. Zombie transformation coming out from Sakura. So she has two lives here. Little Leela, what can she do? So now she does go Courage. Okay, so she gets all of her buffs online here. Jaden, what do you got? Drill shot, 8364. Crucially, does not proc the Courage, but does get the self-heal. So she still has Courage, so you still need to hit her two more times to kill. If that one shot, that would have been huge for Turambar. Preemptive magic comes out from Dark Fina, but the Blade Batch, the stun, lands on Dark Fina. This is looking kind of good for Turambar. Eternal Pain. This should proc Courage on the Little Lilo the Bold. Yeah, no way it doesn't. Only hits her, though. Does not hit the Dark Fina. But who's going to go next? Little Leela. Does Titus have hate? He does not. Delightful Destruction comes out. One-shots the Jaden. Titus does not start the battle with hate. The only way he gets it is if he uses his Saintly Fortress ability. His AI is very strange to use, so he does not have hate right now. But he gets the auto attack on Leela and kills her. It's a 2v1 right now. What does Sakura have? Rebel Intention. This removes Courage. She does not have Courage. She has Re-Raise. Dark Fina, can she kill both right here? Sakura still has Re-Raise online. This might be Turambar's win. Magic Reflex comes out from Titus. Shadow Flare drops the AoE Resist. It does kill the Sakura, but does she have Re-Raise? Yes, she does. What is the CT turn order? Who goes next? It is... Oh, it's Dark Fina again. No way. Is Dr. Dickhead still going to win this? Shadow Flare comes out, drops AoE Resist. It's going to kill Sakura again. Titus is down. Titus, do you have the damage to kill her? I don't know. He's sitting at 2745. He doesn't have the damage, but the Blade Bash lands again. He gets another stun. What is the turn order? Dark Fina. She lapped. She got stunned and then went again. She still goes again. Kama comes out, but he has courage. Oh my god, Titus with one health gets the auto attack and kills Dark Fina. Holy crap. That game was phenomenal. That game was insanely close. That might be the best one all day. Um, wow, I said this in the matchup preview screen. This is so uh, hilariously ironic. Because um, last season, like I said, Turnbar was undefeated until Dark... Uh, Dark Fina... Until Dr. Dickhead took game one from him in the series when they went up against each other. Turambar was completely undefeated. Dr. Dickhead won game one, but Turambar actually ended up winning the series. So does history repeat itself perfectly? Turambar winning game one and Dr. Dickhead wins game two and three and wins the series. I don't know. We're going to have to find out. Is it that or does Turambar um, finally take down Dr. Dickhead and give him his first loss? We're going to have to see. That game was incredibly close. The double Blade Bash stun from Titus, uh, he needed every bit of that because the dark team from Dr. Dickhead is so fast, she still lapped even with the Blade Bash. That, that was just, wow, that was phenomenal. I can't wait for game two and let's go ahead and jump into it. Okay, guys, I'm not going to lie. I am kind of excited because I think these are the exact same two teams from game one does positioning or anything change like that because this game was so damn close did dr dickhead build up some stun resist from game one to game two these are the exact same two teams what is the positioning i believe this is different i think this is different from dr dickhead because i think last time zazan was right next to them it looks like he's on the other side. Is he running bow tie and going to the other side? March of the Stag comes out from Jaden, getting the agility up. Dark Fina probably going to go for re-raise again. And, okay, so this is a difference coming out from Turambar. He does not go zombie re-raise. This time he goes pad foot. Haste up, hate down. Interesting. The zombie re-raise worked... Actually, it really didn't work last time because she came back up and Dark Fina just lapped and killed her. So it really didn't matter. So maybe he thinks going with a different TMR might work better this time. Stone Throw comes out. Not a lot of damage. Drops term or uh, Titus's defense piercing rate, but he's really not a much of a damage dealer. I imagine Sakura's about to nuke this Zazan. Magic Blast Plus comes out. Honestly tanked pretty well by Dark Fina. Rending Bright Blade. Yeah, Zazan is down for the count. So it's a 3v2 early again in Turnbar's favorite favor. Can he close this out in two games? Dark Fina should be able to reach at least Titus. Is this an AoE? No! T 
Titus, again, doesn't have the hate. I forgot he did not use the Saintly Fortress. And she just goes straight for Jaden. Removes him from the fight. She's going to have re-raise here. Sakura is hasted, though. So how does the turn order work out here? Titus, resistance break. Does this kill? It does not kill. That is crucial. Dark Fina still lives. She is still ahead of Sakura in the turn order, turn order, even though she has hate. Delightful destruction comes out. The AoE does not kill Sakura. Dark Fina, though, is going to take her out. This has got to be an AoE. This is going to be Dr. Ticket's... Another magic reflex. Titus kind of putting on a show. Shadow Flare comes out. This is going to kill Sakura. I mean, Titus did work last time, but I don't know how he is possibly going to win this against both of these two units. There's just no way. They're so damn fast. They're going to lap him. This is Shadow in the Moonlight. This is the Limit Break coming out from Little Leela, and uh, Dark Fiend is going to be able to follow it up right after. And uh, might be too good to be true for Turnbar. He ended up winning that game one just barely, but even with like a decent start, this looks like Dr. Dickhead's game here. I believe he does have Courage online. He is blind, <laughs> and the preemptive magic comes out. I'm sorry, he did not have Courage online, actually. Um, Dr. Dickhead takes it in game two. So we're going to a game three. Um, I love game three game series. This is four out of five this week. So well played to the Heinler division. Four out of five is exceptional. I love that. Um, does Turnbar switch it up now? So he won game one. He lost game two. He did. The biggest change that I can see is like the positioning and the TMR change from Sakura. He has to have Sakura, like, he has to get hate on Titus. I, I don't know how he can win this without it, but it's such an awkward thing because um, I know he doesn't necessarily want to use Saintly Fortress, but that is, like, the only way to get hate on Titus unless he runs Bowtie or Vow of Love. It's just such an awkward thing in this fight. So does Turnbar turn off the other abilities and go for Saintly Fortress to get hate on him? Does he go with a completely different team comp? I don't know. I expect Dr. Dickhead to go straight back to the dark team. He won with it in game two. But we've got the final game of the week, guys. And let's go ahead and jump into it. All right, guys. This is the loading screen here. We've got Dr. Dickhead on the left, Turmar on the right. And it looks like the exact same units for the first two games. It's possible that different units are hidden. Um, we can take a look. I expect they're probably the same thing, right? Let's find out here. Loading screen taking its sweet time. It is the exact same thing. It is Little Lilo the Bold, Dark Fina, Zazan versus the Jaden Sakura Titus comp. I want to see, does Titus have hate or is he out front enough that he just kind of soaks the damage? He is in front of everybody else here. Much of the stag coming out from Jaden. Does he go back to the zombie re-raise DMR on Sakura or does he go pad foot again? And my question is, did he not feel like he needed hate on Titus because he had hate down on Sakura? Because last time Jaden got picked off because he didn't have hate down. He does go Saintly Fortress. So yeah, he goes with the switch up. He has hate on the tank. Is this the difference that Turambar needs? Re-raise on to Dark Fina. Zazan. He's got a lot of movement. Can he reach? Yes, he can. Stone throw. Does barely anything, though. Not going to do much at all. It is another pad foot from Sakura. I think she is out of range of an AoE here. Jaden, what does he have? Magic Blast Plus? Takes out the Zazan. Some damage onto Dark Fina. Very similar to the last game, but the biggest difference is Titus has aggro. Is that enough? No. Little Leela pops her Courage. But again, Sakura has Courage removal. I don't know how much the Courage is going to matter if Sakura is able to hit. Dark Fina goes with the Shadow Flare. This is going to pull in Sakura, actually, a little closer. So she's going to take damage... What happens here? Wait a minute. Is this going on to... Oh my god. Rebel Intention. That's going to kill Little Lilo the Bold. Holy crap. The Shadow Flare, I think, actually just helped Turambar. I actually don't know if uh, Sakura can reach that without being pulled in closer. Holy crap. Jaden gets the auto attack. Turambar just smoked him in game three. Turambar just wins. Oh my god. I... Obviously, that is not what Dr. Dickhead planned. I... I don't know off the top of my head of the range of Rebel Intention, but the fact that Sakura moved three spaces, I am very curious. Could Sakura have reached that if she didn't get pulled in? I, I don't know. I actually don't know the answer to that. Shadow Flare might have just helped her close the gap on Little Leela. 
but damn, well played to Turin Bar. Dr. Dickhead was undefeated um, this entire season up to this point, and he ends up winning it in a three-game series. So Turin Bar, um, an excellent player from last season, obviously doing exceptionally well this season too, gets a big series win here, keeping him right in the thick of it. I think right around fourth place here, I think for the standings. So it should be really interesting. We're done with five weeks here. Um, excellent showcase by both players. Let's go ahead and check out the stat leaders and the standings as well. All right, guys, the assist leaders after five weeks for the Heinler division. Number one, of course, we've got Zazan of the Foolish Mortals, 27 assists. Incredibly uh, well played by Dr. Dickhead all season. Like I said, we just saw him lose his very first series. He's had four wins up to that point, running that dark squad to excellent success. Second place, not a surprise, Naya with 19 of the Materia Hunters. Honestly, she would have more, uh, but McCrane runs so many different team comps, which is so fun to watch. So that's probably why she's only second place instead of first, to be honest. Salir, third overall, Spaghetti Western with 18 assists. Again, he loves those like triple mage comps. Um, they put in a lot of work up to this point. Lilo the Bold of Foolish Mortals. You're going to see a lot of Foolish Mortals on these lists because he uses those, those three units quite a bit with 17. Titus of the Fire Ferrets, the MVP um, of this last series, I would say, with 16. Titus of the Spaghetti Western with 15. Kilfay and Darkfina both with 14. Yuna of the Straw Hats with 13. And Miranda also of the Rock Boys with 12. For the kill leaders, obviously, we've got Darkfina of the Foolish Mortals with 15 kills. Second place, kind of a surprise, Sorrow from Sandrock. Um, getting a big series win today, putting himself in second place for the kill leader for Sorrow here with 13. Lilo the Bold with 12. Skahal also with 12 from the Spaghetti Western. Ildira Sweetheart put on an absolute show this week for the Material Hunters, 10 kills. Another one just crushing people, Miranda with 10 from the Rock Boys. Lucia Halloween with 8, Perrine with 8, and Gargus with 8 from the Fire Ferrets, Sappers, and Spaghetti Western, respectively. And bringing up the rear in 10th place, another Sandrock unit, Silma, with 7 kills. Um, honestly, so many units that have just put in so many cool showcases throughout this season. Um, it's been incredibly fun to watch. Let's go ahead and check out the standings. Okay, guys, for the standings after five weeks for the Heinler division, we've finally broken the tie up at the top. McCrane, first place with the Materia Hunters with 15 points, a perfect 5-0 series record, dropping only one single game in any of his series. Second place, we've got Dr. Dickhead and the Foolish Mortals with 13 points with a 4-0-1 record. Third place, Ram 9, also very impressive. The Rock Boys with 12 points. Turambar, with that big win over Dr. Dickhead, boosts himself up into the top four. If the playoffs started today he would be in it that is how it works we need the top four from each of the divisions so currently sitting at nine points he is in control of his own destiny fifth place we've got a two-way tie between maverick and jesus lbl the spaghetti western and the straw hats maverick edging him out with that tiebreaker being currently minus one in his games whereas uh jesus is currently minus two spike in seventh place with bebop's crew not far behind only seven points Catra, again, putting himself in that conversation today with that series win with six points. Zathria, again, these standings are so tight. Five points with the Ghost Bloods in ninth. And even Jabba with three points in last place, the Sappers. This division is incredibly competitive. I don't think you can take anyone for granted. All of the series and all of the matches seem to be really, really great, um, which is awesome as a shoutcaster because I just really, really enjoy it. So I'm hoping all of you guys enjoy watching this. Um, I know I mentioned this in the Rundall draft but we are going to have our supplemental draft uh this week so typically what we do is we have a nine week regular season after five weeks we have what's called a supplemental draft it is another draft which is only one round every single team in the division will draft one more unit from the pool of units that were available at the end of our draft the first time so no new units that just came out simply units that came that were available in our original draft which i believe was every unit released on global by february 1st 2023 i believe was what the mark was and the draft order is in reverse order of standing so the draft order is jebba zathria katra spike jesus lbl maverick turambar ram nine dr dickhead and mccrane that is pretty much all there is. Every single team will add one more unit to try and make their team stronger. I'm excited to see what those new units can do over the next four weeks as teams try to push for that top four to try and get themselves into the playoffs to have a brand new draft with our top eight teams. So it should be 
a hell of a good time. I'm really, really excited. Thank you guys so much for watching. Again, huge shout out to the guest casters last week who took my place. You guys did an awesome job, but I'm very, very happy to be back. I truly enjoy doing this. So thank you guys, everybody, for watching. Thank you for your support. You guys are awesome. I hope you have a wonderful day.